I didn't even think of what to say today. All right, today let's talk about Goethe's Faust, the relationship between part one and part two. I've carried over a few slides from the last uh, presentation, and yet these are sort of like the lost boys of slides. I don't think I'm even going to have time to address them very much today either. And yet these slides will exist on two presentations for you to read at your leisure. Something I'd really like to talk about today for just a couple minutes before really launching in to the relationship between part one and part two of uh, Goethe's spouse. Uh, uh, what did the Germans say? Uh, 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 they say health, and yet I'm forgetting the word for health that they say. Gesundheit. There we go. Gesundheit. Very good. Moving through languages. Salud. Gesundheit. Something that I want to mention about this text as a two part text is that it has a high degree of what we call metafictionality. Now, to call something metafiction is a fiction that draws attention to the fact that it is, in fact, fiction. So unlike, say, Star Wars, where you're drawn in by the music of John Williams, and there's immediately a very grand uppercase, um, a bit of uh, script that goes in front of us amidst the stars. This is a long, long time ago, in a place far, far away. This is a narrative conceit to draw us in to the narrative space, to draw us in to the, into the, uh, the movie in this case. Goethe goes the opposite direction. He does as much as he can in order to maintain space between us and the drama itself. We have a dedication, dedication, okay. So this is obviously not just its own world, there's a dedication. Then we have a prologue on the stage as well. Um, or a prelude in the theater, as it's sometimes called. And then we have a prologue in heaven. And at some point, as a reader, we're starting to think, get on with it. Get to the story itself. These are barriers to us getting into the story. And then, as we noted um, during the uh, forum last Friday, then the story itself is written in uh, rhyme is, uh, and, in, and also in various meters. Iambic tetrameter, when uh, Helen is first speaking, and then she's speaking in rhyme. Finishing foul sentences, and then we have a few other uh, meters and rhymes throughout, or at least meters throughout the entirety of the text. And in fact, uh, what is it? A uh, field, uh, uh, right before dungeon, there is no meter as well. And so something about the this litany of prologues, and also about in, including a meter in a text, unlike Don Quixote, is that this is the opposite of inviting somebody in. These are barriers to interpretation as well as to enjoyment. These are barriers that must be hurdled over. These are, these are hurdles to our aesthetic enjoyment. And so a question that one might have is why? Why, if part of the purpose of a work of art, of an aesthetic production, is to produce aesthetic delight or joy or, or a pleasant feeling while reading or witnessing the art, why does he include all these very problematic instances? And so uh, just one thing, let me read one quick quote from the poet. And remember that the poet stands at odds with the director in the play on the stage. It is the director who wishes to give the mass what they want so that he can keep the theater open. He seems to occupy an economic consciousness. You got to make money to keep the, to keep the doors open. We were making, uh, we were talking about the Simpsons prior to class, right? Look, and this is generally considered popular culture. It includes many popular elements in it, but uh, those Simpson writers, as well as uh, as well as the voice actors like Nancy Cartwright, I think there was something online today where she did something like 20 voices in 40 seconds. She does many of the voices, um, like Hank Azaria and, the, and various other figures for the Simpsons. In order for that show to go on for over 30 years, it needs to stay popular. It needs to make the money necessary to justify the cast, the producers, the directors, the uh, all the people who are involved with the text. This is what the director does. And yet, is art simply mass production? Is it like the Andy Warhol, very famous picture of Campbell's suit? Have you all seen that before? Think about it, even if you haven't seen it. Imagine a big square, and it's like just Campbell's suit can after Campbell's suit can after Campbell's suit can. They're all the same. They're all copies of each other. And so a question, particularly because Andy Warhol was very involved in advertising, which is itself an art that seeks to make money for people, is an advertisement, especially one that shows a an image repeated ad infinitum ad nauseum. Is that art? So here's my question. 
perhaps it is a question that is really a statement. Is the relationship between the poet, who seems to want to bring about an artistic ideal, I'll read this in a moment, and the director, the modern situation for the artist, where one has to bifurcate one's consciousness in order to think both what will appeal and make money, but what will also ennoble and, and, and push art forward. There seem to be dual functions. To, uh, to, um, to put it most poetically, it is as if the most poetic way of thinking about poetry is to represent the transcendent or the absolute or to transcend language, I'm just gonna say lang here, in order to see truth. That something like the, that literature can be something like the mirror-esque shield of persons, which he can see the face of nature that turns one to stone, Medusa, and through this artistic reflection, can see it for what it is, but not be destroyed by a pure interaction with it, in the same way that, say, um, Simile was blown up when she saw her lover Zeus in all of his glory. So the poetic ideal seems to be to touch something true, or at least to point at something true. Sort of like, uh, have you ever seen the creation of Adam, the Renaissance art, where Adam's kind of lying here, this is a bad picture. And he's kind of sticking out his hand like this, and God's kind of on the cloud here, and he's sticking out his hand. And that's about as far as they are from each other. And the Adam's finger is kind of like this. Oh, you know, is it? Not that. All you have to do is that. I'm going to more. And that's supposed to be us, right? We're so close to the absolute. We're so close to the ideal. All we have to do is reach out and touch it. And yet does Adam, in this case, reach out and touch it? Does not seem to. And so, is the relationship between the poet and the director in the very beginning of this text, in the prelude on the theater, supposed to show the division in the consciousness of an artist who exists in the modern time? No longer is this ancient art, artist, or this, is this artist like an ancient classical times trying to represent mythology in a very interesting, real way. No longer is this an author from the medieval times who's attempting to represent things in, say, a Christian, Jewish, or Muslim way and to, uh, and to extol the ideal of those faiths. But rather now, the artist finds himself, herself, their self, itself, in an odd position of serving two masters both the transcendent ideal of an art, but also the, uh, the consumers of art, of whom there are many more in the modern situation, many more people who read, many more people who live a bourgeois lifestyle, who live within cities, work jobs within cities, make money within cities, and then seek city pleasures, like going to the theater, which uh, is something that um, Shakespeare helped to make extremely popular with his globe. Let me read what the poet says. Spare me your public. This is, of course, a response to the director. And it's very kind it's to glimpse. It is enough to put our thoughts to rout. Don't let me see the surging crowd that can, against our wills, draw us into its world. Take me instead to some celestial refuge. Nothing glides the poet's quiet joy. It's like an Eden, right? Um, I did. Uh, take me instead to some celestial refuge where nothing blights the poet's quiet joy. A joyous celestial place in the heavens, celestial heaven, uh, in the sky. And where with godlike bounty, love, and friendship create and nurture the blessings of our hearts. You can feel the idealism dripping from this. Alas, alas, this is, this is the great turn from idealism to realism, isn't it? Alas. What had its source in depths of feeling and timid, timid lips could only stammer, defective here, but here perhaps successful, interesting, is brutally engulfed by the tempestuous moment, almost caught. Often it is expressed in perfect form only after many years of effort. This is poet himself. Uh, Goethe, speaking after six decades of working on this work, what glitters lives, but for the moment, this is crucial. What glitters lives but for the moment so limer, so similar to our own cliche that says all that glimmers is not gold, like pirate fools gold. 
as it were. What glitters lives, but for the moment, what has real worth survives for all posterity. The question that I think perforates part one and part two, and is the major question of this text. Uh, well, let's put it in the choir of major questions. So one of the arc questions or arch questions is this. Can art produce something of real worth which survives for all time? Can a human produce something of real worth that survives for all time? And I will say at the very least from what we see in part two is that most attempts are going to fail and most attempts do fail. Does that mean that all will and that this text itself is ultimately pessimistic? I am not yet ready to say. I'm not yet ready to conclude the text. But I consider that the great anxiety of this text. And you can understand why this would be the anxiety of a text that was that the author spent 60 years on. Spent 60 years on a thing. Devote your life to it. Put all your art into it. Of course, one of the major questions would be, was it worth my time? Did I create something worth all the energy? Will this even survive beyond my death? I mean, that's a question that can't be answered for any artist, right? You want to be one of the greats who's celebrated for all time. You have very little control over this outside of creating the work of art itself. And so is it a waste of time to pursue the transcendent? Or ought one just to, you know, uh, should one just uh, uh, pander to the mass, as it were, and make some money and have some cheap laughs, be merry, uh, what is it? And, and yes, and to just, uh, uh, there's a, that, that's a full quote, but it doesn't come to mind at the moment, but to just frolic and be merry, um, rather than to painstakingly attempt to produce something of infinite worth that may not happen and, and may in fact, and this is, I think, a nice connection to Don Quixote, may in fact be, uh, one may pursue the absolute as an artist in the same way that Don Quixote pursues absolute beauty through Dulcinea. We know that he is deluded, that there is no Dulcinea. Is an artist who attempts to pursue and represent the absolute, himself, herself, their self, um, ultimately a Don Quixote pursuing an ideal which does not exist? This would, were I an artist rather than a literary critic, close but different, this would be something that might keep me up in that. Does my life ultimately, does my life's work ultimately have value that justifies the effort and skill that I put into? And this is a big question, not only in art, but if you ever say create a product or a company, you're going to have to prove to people that your product has value and you're going to have to advertise. And, uh, and hopefully it does, hopefully it does. But when first putting work into something prior to it having been completed or being sold, it's very hard to tell what the value of such a thing is. Uh, and uh, the economists will tell you. All right, I have here the prologue in heaven. I'm not going to spend much time on this because it could take its own lect lecture, but you really should read the book of Job's version of the wager between uh, the devil and, and God and Faust's version of this. They are a little bit different, but importantly different, and different enough to warrant an essay about these differences. But the one thing I really want to mention from all these quotes, and this quote from Faust, not from the book of Job, is that then to this is the Lord speaking, enjoy free visitation. I never did abominate your kind. Of all the spirits of negation, remember May, so May is the nominal negator in Greek. He even, his name starts with a negation. It would be like me call, being called Mr. No, or Professor No, or, or Nofesser Schmid, or something like that. So yeah, I mean, literally. Um, uh, then to enjoy free visitation, I never did abominate your kind of all the spirits of negation. The rogue has been least onerous by my mind. I think the rogue here is essential to looking at this devil, now this devil differs from a Christian devil. He's called a rogue, a rogue. If I think of some synonyms of rogue, I think of a scamp, I think of a scallywag. <laughs> I think of somebody who crosses boundaries, who breaks rules, who, who like Robin Hood, 
um, follows a, a different law from the law of the land. Uh, Robin Hood, perhaps like a natural, right? Or maybe a communist law. It takes from the rich and gives them to and gives to the poor. Um, but he does not follow the rule of Prince John, um, who he constantly accosts in Sherwood Forest. And so the rogue is a transgressive figure. Trans, as in trans means cross. So like trans and uh, cis alpine gaul, trans means across, cis means new. And so those that's where those prefixes come from. They're, they're geographic in origin. And so a transgressor, somebody that crosses boundaries, someone who uh, uh, I think of myself as a young person, I, I was a minor transgressor. Usually there, it was quiet time and I would talk and that was how I was transgressive. And I would I was also often called smart, right? Somebody would say something, I would say something witty in response and they would uh, say, you're a student, I'm a teacher, D, or you know, or now you, we need to talk to your parents. I didn't have enough power to be a transgressor. But then I became a teacher myself. And so perhaps I'm a transgressor. But the reason that I bring this up is that this is a fundamental different way of looking at the devil. The devil as a rogue is not the devil as an evil genius. The devil as a rogue, as something that transgresses. Well, if one thinks about the story of Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve were given one rule in Eve. Do not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Or one day, for some day you shall surely die. And they transgress on that. And then on that one, they, they are themselves rogues. They are influenced by a snake, but the choice is made by them, indicated by the fact that they receive the punishment. The snake does too, but they do as well. They are also complicit. And so, Adam and Eve, in order to eat Eden, this ideal world of, of, of nakedness, but without vulnerability, of, of, of pure self-knowledge shared between all things, um, is left in order for Adam and Eve to enter into nature. And now time and disease and pain and childbirth enter into their existences. And so you might say that some measure of idealism is an attempt to return to Eden. And yet, my question about the transgressor, about the rogue, is is not Satan as a rogue, as a necessary transgressor, is he not a function of nature used to move human civilization forward? But Adam and Eve stay in Eden. Is there ever any development? Does Do we ever come about? Is there ever a United States? Is there ever a, 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 a United Nations? Does history ever move? Or it would sort of seem like, no, they kind of say immortal in the garden, and do they even have children? I don't know. I don't know. But it takes an act of, act of transgression for history begin, to begin. The ultimate transgressor seems to be Mephistopheles, the rogue. Is he a necessary part of existence? Is he himself a representation not of evil, but of nature? And of a nature that we all share, that humans share as well. Hmm. So are we ourselves sort of a division between that which sets laws and that which transgresses laws? And is there a naturalness to both? Hmm. Okay, let's talk about some features of part one before we truly, truly compare uh, parts one and parts two. There are 25 scenes in part one. There are 50 scenes in the entirety of uh, part one and part two. Something, uh, uh, and this is of course excluding the dedication, prelude, and prologue. Part one seems to be more cohesive and realist as a narrative than part two. Much easier to describe what happens in part one, right? There's this scholar, he's become world weary. He's sick of his books and thinks that, think that his knowledge brings him no happiness. He tends to summon an earth spirit. The earth spirit denigrates him. And then the figure of Mephistopheles, uh, a, a Luciferian figure, the devil, comes from a black poodle, makes a, a wager with him to follow him around and to grant him his every desire, Faust's, until Faust asks for more than just an algin, a second moment, um, a second moment um, of joy, which he will eventually do all the way in Act 5 of Faust Part 2. But, so Faust makes this wager, pursues this common, uh, this, this uh, I, I don't say common to denigrate her, but this, uh, or to abase her, but this woman who is not of the same social status 
that he is, which is itself a, a major theme throughout Renaissance and Romantic uh, literature. And you even see this in Don Quixote with Aldonza Lorenza, herself being a peasant girl who is then uh, uh, turned into, idealized into uh, Dulcinea. But um, Faust pursues her, Faust lays with her, Faust impregnates her, and eventually her life is ruined by the fact that she uses a sleep draft to accidentally kill her mother rather than put her to sleep. Her brother Valentine is killed trying to defend her honor, and she uh, kills her own child and then um, and then dies in, in the dungeon, but is saved. And so, sort of a sad story, but a fairly easy story to encapsulate. So what is part two about? And it's five acts and 25 scenes much harder to say. It's much more impressionistic. It's much more surreal. It is much more like a sausage full of classical themes and characters who, uh, who are presented like a spectacle in front of us. There's less to grasp hold of, less to follow, and more just to see. It's far more operatic. Right? You understand that I mean operatic in the way that many English speakers watch opera. It's in Italian, it's in German. Perhaps there's English uh, translation on a screen in front of one, but mostly you're just listening to the music. You're hearing, you're letting it wash over you. Um, but it's very hard to follow. Sort of like a very good a literary lecture, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, in any case, part one's a little bit more cohesive, maybe a lot of more cohesive than part two. It also represents a romantic desire for sensual pleasure. Faust is made young again. He drinks a youth potion. He becomes physically younger and more libidinous. This means that he is, is more given to romantic sexual desire because of his youth. There's a mixture of folk magic. Um, folk magic of summoning an earth spirit at one point, which is use of potions and religion, in the presence, of course, of the devil in the mise en scene. Part two continues a desire for experience, but it expands it. Not simply sexual gratification and desire for Marguerite or Gretchen here, but a desire to experience everything in the world. So ideal love between, say, a romantic personality and a classical one in Faust and Helen. Um, childbearing, and the loss of a child, um, and yet a, an oddly spiritual, an odd child. Uh, one wonders whether the pathos of the loss of Euphorion for Faust and Helen equals the pathos of watching Gretchen die in front of us at the end of part one. Does one feel as bad for Faust at, at the end of act three when Euphorion dies? Or is there is it still sort of a pale representation of part one? Like uh, the night of the white moon reflecting the night of the mirrors in Don Quixote. Is that the relationship between part two and part one? I wonder. Um, there's also conquering uh, an army as well as conquering of nature. And you notice also there are transformations involved here. And transformation is a major, major part of, of part two. I mean, just if I were to mention Acts 4 and Acts 5, the, the act of defeating one army by another is the act of transforming uh, one. Uh, if the army of one people defeats another people, part of that people's land who is defeated becomes part of the other. There's a transformation. And part five, Faust literally, in order to expand his own land, like somebody in the Netherlands uses something like dice in order to um, to uh, to dam the water and to uh, to unflood it, so that the land is reclaimed from the water, so that which is natural is reclaimed by the social. A transformation there. I mean, something that I used to wonder about when I was driving, being driven as a young person, is we would leave Atlanta, the city. And we, I would find out that I was still in a county. And I was like, what is the relationship between one county to another, particularly if we're no longer in the city? Um, where does one begin and one end? And how does a county relate to a city? And these are, these were, uh, these are interesting questions, but those are interesting questions to me. Hmm. Hmm. All right, let's talk a little bit about um, the relationship between part one and part two, and in particular, let's talk about romanticism versus neoclassicism and how these two uh, generic styles relate to a work which may be called holistically modern. Romanticism uh, uh, pursues a subjective idea. 
an ideal that is generated by a subjective consciousness, a personal consciousness, it does not pursue a transcendent ideal in the way that, say, a classical or, say, a medieval Christian uh, consciousness might, that is a communal idea, but rather an ideal which is created by one's own self. Um, so, so uh, what is a subjective ideal for me might be very different from what is a subjective ideal for you. And so we might live very different sorts of lives. Um, that said, it might still be claimed that we are still pursuing the absolute, that which exists outside of human experience, but in our own different ways. And something important about romanticism is that especially with its mixture with early 19th century and late 18th century German idealist philosophy from um, Immanuel Kant through um, um, GWF Hegel as well as Schopenhauer and Fichte is, is that there's a real concern with the fact that we have subjective consciousnesses and we have these subjective attributes to being human. We speak in a sp specific language. We don't speak in a universal language. So how can we even understand each other? We live in a certain time, the late 19th century, the early 21st century. How do we escape the conventions of thought that encompass one in a certain time? We exist in a certain geographical location. How do we escape all of these subjective constraints on our ability to see the absolute? And in fact, yeah, Immanuel uh, Kant uh, even problematizes the issue worse, he suggests that the way that our mind is structured makes us think in certain ways that, that keep us, preclude us from being able to see the absolute. If we are, as many scientists today suggest, sort of a, a super mammal that is evolved from the others and has a certain uh, ability to represent reality in, in front of itself, is our very physical nature, does that keep us from seeing does, or does that make us see in a human way rather than an absolute way? And is there any way to transcend seeing things as sort of a natural creature, a natural human, a mortal creature? Can we see like an immortal creature who would not be subject to instinct and the presence of physical eyes? These are, these are major questions for the romantics. Can you see outside of yourself is ultimately the question. Um, and it's a very difficult question to answer. It's very easy to say no to. And ah, yes, a pursuit of an ideal spirituality unconstrained by nature or the body. Something interesting about romanticism is that they, they have strange relationship to nature. Romanticism wishes to pursue an unadulterated ideal that itself, itself uh, is not mixed with nature. And so part of what is scary about nature is that Insofar as humans are natural, they are mortal. And if they are mortal, they will age. And that eventually means going from the beauty of youth to the decrepitude of, of old age, and they will die. And so there is a desire in romantic literature to deny the natural, the natural process. And so sometimes um, het um, heterosexual relationship is a shoot, right? Because part of the nature of that sort of relationship, particularly in the 19th century, is reproduction. But what's the problem with reproduction? If one reproduces, well, why does a species reproduce? Because each individual within a species is not immortal. And so to reproduce is to admit the power of nature to replace and kill you. Um, and so the romantics had a lot of troubles. With, with nature and very much like uh, sort of an androgynous aesthetic, which one understands that, you know, sort of um, prior to puberty, boys and girls are much more similar to each other. They do not yet take on their social roles. They do not take on their secondary sexual uh, reproductive um, attributes as well. They're far more similar to each other. And so there's a romantic desire to say sexless and, uh, and to, deny the necessity of reproducing and therefore done. And you can see how this is sort of a losing battle, right? As much as one would like, and we are very romantic as a culture in America, right? We care a lot about our teeth. We have a lot of non-aging sorts of snake oil as well as uh, things that people take, simply being one of the, the new ones. It, to fight against nature is to fight a losing 
battle, but a battle that the romantic has found necessary. And this is very different from classical ideals, where there, there seems to be, and this is something we can certainly write about, more of an acceptance of nature rather than a rejection of nature. And something you really might want to think about is in contemporary American culture, do, do we reject nature? Do we try to, uh, to, to or, or do we try to dominate nature? Or do we accept nature? All right, on a different pole, neoclassicism. This is part two, especially. Um, the very first act, we have a masquerade of, of, of classical figures, and a masquerade with itself a representation of, uh, of a pageantry, grew out of pageantry, um, uh, originally French, though I would have thought it would have been Italian and yet, but masquerade is a French word, so it's masked. Uh, with QED, the track for the QED. Um, there's a masquerade in which we see the fates, as well as several uh, several other classical figures. In classical about Purvis Knight in Act Two, we have a spectacle of, of classical figures over and over and over again. Helen of Troy, Chiron the Centaur, the mothers, who are very recherche uh, classical reference, Menelaus, the husband of Helen, Nereus, um, the father of the Nereids, like the mother of Achilles. Uh, Philemon and Bacchus, so you'll see those in, uh, you'll see them in book five. If you're very interested in researching them, you might look into Ovid's Metamorphoses. These are, um, these are two figures of hospitality. They're the, the two old people who, who uh, Zeus and Hermes visited in, in the guise of, and it's very similar to the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, by the way, extremely similar. I would say almost the exact same message um, at, as it. And when the two angels come to visit these these individuals, and so well, uh, a god and his other god. You know, what is the difference substantially between an angel and a god? Spiritual beings, right? And maybe different hierarchical level, but substantially very similar. So uh, Zeus and Hermes visit Philemon and Bacchus, and Philemon and Bacchus uh, want to offer the best food that they have. Remember, this is like super archaic Greece at the time, um, mythologically archaic. And they, they chase after a chicken. And you know, they're old. And so imagine chasing a chicken as an old person. And you're a god. We see these old people chasing after a chicken. How are we going to react? We're going to laugh. It's laughing. And supposedly Hermes and Zeus laughed so hard that they revealed themselves to be gods. They laughed themselves out of disguise. And so Philemon and Bacchus would fall on their knees and say, oh my gods, we didn't know that you were gods. And, um, we only offered you what we could, and Zeus and uh, Hermes say, no, you offered us all that you possibly could. That's, that's very different. Um, you may not have much, but you offered what you had, and that was, that's what's important. That's the hospitality um, element of the story. And so they're made into priests who then, uh, when they die, they uh, become intertwined of oak and linden trees. Uh, these two figures are murdered by Faustus, cronies through Mephistopheles at the end. Uh, part two. Something you might really want to think about is if these are figures of hospitality, does their murder at the end of Faust indicate there is no hospitality left in the modern world? That there is no home, in fact, even left in the modern world. That we are, as Gail Lukash says, uh, transcendentally homeless as moderns. Transcendentally. I want you to think about that. Not, not only does that mean homeless potentially everywhere, but it means even it means even at the most transcendent ideal level, you're lonely. At the highest possible level, at the most substantial level, you are homeless. That there is perhaps that part of your essence as a creature in the modern time is that you are uh, uh, without house, without home. There, there is no home. That, that that concept is a concept that disappears with the coming of the modern. And I, I think that's a very uh, interesting thought to have. Well, in any case, more about neoclassicism um, next time because we have a presentation and I need to give some time to it.